ADHD Rewired, episode 483. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Jessica Hickstead. Jessica was late diagnosed with autism and ADHD, and she brings together her life experiences and education to advocate for invisible disabilities. Growing up the awkward kid, which so many of us can relate to, uh, she faced life's rough spots head on, creating resiliency and determination. These skills proved valuable in completing her PhD and dedicating research into invisible disabilities to help promote positive social change. Jessica, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Eric. I'm glad to be here. So we, I I met you at this, at uh, the 2022 uh, chat conference, the international conference on ADHD, and you were sharing me kind of what you were, kind of the work that you were doing. And I think I'm, my response to you was, uh, you have to come on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. It was more like, you will be on my podcast. Because <laughs> I just, I, I love like a lot of the research that you're, you're looking at um, is sort of the, the macro component of sort of what we talk about in our coaching groups and what, what is so critical for success for individuals with ADHD, autism, learning disabilities, um, and that's self-awareness, self-advocacy skills, and self-determination. And what you're looking at is, all right, how do we, from a systems perspective, like help individuals be successful in the yes. workplace? Yes. And it's, it is uh, detrimental right now in the workplace. There is no instrument that quantitatively can measure this. So how are policy changes supposed to happen if there is nothing that tells an organization, okay, you're good here. You're not so good here. This is what needs to be worked on. Keep going and doing this the right way they're not being held really accountable. I mean, yeah, there's organizations out there that give their, you know, oh, you're blessed. You, Yeah, you're you're an advocate. But how is that being measured? <laughs> and I was surprised when you, when you shared with me when you were uh, proposing this this uh, research to your uh, your advisor in your PhD program. And they were, I guess, if I remember correctly, I give the impression that there must be plenty of instruments out there. And you're like, no, actually, I've like searched far and wide and there's not a single instrument out there. Yeah, no, there, there's not. And even like getting things to relate, because being a new PhD and writing dissertation, you have to have, you know, you have to cite things. And so like, they'll be like, OK, so can you cite something? I'm like, uh, not really. <laughs> like, There's something that was just came up in 2022, which obviously I started this in 2016. So that shows you, it, but it's a like a worldwide diversity. I mean, it looks at workplace, but even at that, they only surveyed blue collar workers, like people with degrees. And so I'm like, that. that's not your, <laughs> I mean, that's some workplaces, sure. but that's not everyone. Right. So, so not looking at like knowledge workers and stuff like that. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, we need to help everyone, not just a subset. <laughs> And it's interesting, too, because I think that, you know, when I first started this, the, the podcast back in 2014, the advice that most people gave in this space was don't disclose at work. Yeah. And, and I yeah. still think that, like, that's probably still good advice. But I think that the, the how strong we feel about that is, has been waning, which is, I think, a good thing. I think that more yes. and more people are actually finding some success with disclosing in the workplace. And, and I think just in the last year or so, I, there was a, uh, we had a, uh, we did an interview or an episode of maybe in the last year and we posted it and, and there was a, uh, in one of 
the ADHD Facebook groups, I uh, you know I was pinged on the uh, in the conversation uh, about it, but there was a discussion about it, and what I was so like pleasantly surprised by was how many people responded to this talking about how they have disclosed in the workplace and that it w- had been a positive experience. And you know, as I was reading through this, it was a pretty long active um, thread. I was like, huh, maybe the tides are starting to turn. I definitely I agree with that. I have seen the, st- the tides starting to turn. And there's still people on both sides that argue, no, never, don't do it. It's the worst thing ever. And that's what I always tell people. It is your personal story, your personal experience, and it is your personal decision. If you were to ask me, I say, no, 100% disclose. <laughs> because number one, do you want to work somewhere that doesn't fully accept who you are? That, yes, we need to make money, we need income, but at what cost to ourselves and our well-being? And if you're having to mask and hide who you are, (laughs) which we all know ADHD is a big part of who we are, you just are going to be so worn out and you're not going to last. You're going to have turnover, you're going to get fired, (laughs) then you're just going to have all those negative feelings again. Like, I'm a failure, I can't do this. (laughs) You know, there's there's a number of different models on executive functioning and, and I'm thinking right now of the Thomas Brown model where it just has that, that kind of composite model where it has like um, planning, initiation, emotional self-management, um, and, and I think like two or three others. And I was just thinking like, I think they need to add masking as an yes. executive because it like masking is a huge executive function drain. Yes. Yeah. And I, I actually write about that in, in my dissertation. That's like a big part of it is like you are using an executive function to mask. You are having to use part of your brain. So you are not able to produce at work anywhere near 100%. So think about how good you can produce when you are masking. So let's take down that barrier. Number one, that's going to be beneficial to yourself and your own well-being and beneficial to the organization. You're going to have these workers that, holy crap, they can get like two days done in a day. (laughs) I, and it, that, that's the point that I'm trying to come out with this and a lot of the questions that are in the survey point that out and how the attitudes and stigma of people within the organization feel toward those things. So then gives quantitatively how an organization can improve. So I, I, it's a whole win-win and it's just opening that transparency and that awareness, the acceptance. And that is like the one big thing that I found in my data is acceptance is actually the biggest statistical significance towards improvement. I love Acceptance. hearing that. I look cuz it just, it reinforces <laughs> the the research that I did when I was in grad school and it's just it's <laughs> it's just so true and it's it's you know and what I find so interesting is how many people um I work with who in on a surface level conversation they'll be like yeah I I've, I've, I've accepted my ADHD and then yeah. we start to dig into the actual work of like that we do in coaching <laughs> And like, mm-hmm. oh, I had more to do here. <laughs> and it's it's with, kind of without fail. It's like, I think a self-acceptance is like a, it's a never ending um, sort of onion that we are peeling back a lot. Exactly. I, I sit there all the time, even myself, even with doing all this deep diving I do, I still find myself masking and I'm like, stop it. <laughs> and like, you know, I find myself fidgeting and then making myself stop and then going, why am I making myself just fidget? It's okay. <laughs> are there, are there certain like places or people that you find that you tend to mask more with than others? Um, when it's a new situation, definitely. Uh, I mask a lot more and I'm trying to break that and it's hard. So now when I meet people and stuff, I'd be like, I just, Hey, I have autism and ADHD. So I, I may just, be a little bit, but then that starts a whole nother conversation. And I find it now more, they're like, oh, so does my kid. Or, oh, so do I. And and then it takes, it just, those barriers come down. I, I've even noticed that in the workplace I'm in right now, the more I've started talking about it, I have all these coworkers reach. So like, thanks for speaking up. I'm always scared to talk about it. It opens up. That's it's awesome. that acceptance. <laughs> it's That's like, awesome. And yes, it is scary, but you think about it, all the other stigmatized groups that have gone through this and yes, are still fighting. But the more that it's talked about, the more it starts getting accepted and everyone's, we get along. <laughs> so. so amongst all the things that you're doing, you are also a mom. Yes. <laughs> and you were not diagnosed with ADHD until your kids were born. Your, kid, your, your first was born? Yeah, until after going, I, I knew something was different about him. And then uh, I was going through school. I was originally going to be, uh, I wanted to be a special ed teacher because uh, I always was pulled towards people with special needs and I loved it. <laughs> and I did substitute teaching and 
So did that. And as I was going through those special ed classes, they started talking about autism. And I had never, I mean, God, this was, I'm trying to remember, how, he was four-ish. So 2004, somewhere around there. And I'm like, what is this autism? I'm like, that's my kid. <laughs> I had never heard of it. So then, you know, got him diagnosed and in there getting him diagnosed and they look over at me and they go, you know, you are too. I'm like, we're here for my kid, not me. <laughs> so so how, how was that for you when, when uh, this, this clinician said to you, uh, that, you know, you're autistic too? <laughs> um, it was kind of like, it, it was that total, you know, you're, you're not supposed to be doing this to me. This I'm here for my kid. <laughs> don't, don't psychoanalyze me. And, but then I started really thinking back to my childhood. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> like, even then I went to ask my mom because in school I, I, I was special. I got to sit next to the teacher and got like extra time during recess getting help. But I just thought I was helping the teacher. Um, <laughs> Which says so much, right? <laughs> yes. And so I asked my mom, uh, it was like, um, why didn't you ever get me tested? Well, you did fine. You got good grades. Which then goes on the whole thing of why girls are underdiagnosed. <laughs> because we do. We, we're, we're used to having to act towards social norms. So then our different actions get missed. Because <laughs> we're already taught to mask from like day one from when we're young. And then the high intelligence rate, and we can hit all those other average above, you know, I was hitting way above average on all those testing, except for reading comprehension. <laughs> I actually have a learning disability in that. Uh, and it's just, it started putting everything together. And then I started getting myself tested and I got the, the learning disability one first, the reading comprehension. And then I was like, okay, there's more to it than this. And, 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 I, and my, I just want to, just to sort of put a point on this, you know, we were talking about the, the self-awareness piece, the self-advocacy, self-determination. You have a learning disability. You mm -hmm. have ADHD. Yep. You have autism. <laughs> and you have a PhD. Yes. <laughs> it's been That's a long amazing. road. <laughs> yeah, but like, yeah. holy cow. Well, and I think it also speaks like so strongly to like when you're interested in something and like, how important yes. interest is to neurodivergent brains, right? Yes. It doesn't matter how much you're getting paid for something. If you're not interested in it, like you're going to struggle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you looked at my degree, so my bachelor's is in art <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and graphic design. <laughs> then my master's in, in information technology and then my PhD is now in psychology. Yeah. So that shows you ADHD. Right there. That, that's fantastic. <laughs> I know. I actually got asked by one one place that I was interviewing. They're like, okay, I see you have like a lot of job changes like every year. But I was like, okay, how can I creatively answer this? <laughs> like, I'd like to learn. And, you know, when I feel like I've gotten to not learning much more from an organization, then I go to somewhere else. <laughs> that's, that's a great, great answer that I think that uh, probably lots of listeners can actually use. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that, and that is one, you know, one thing I address is always remember when you're interviewing or being there, you are actually interviewing that company. And there are questions so you can yeah. ask them and gauge how they're answering to see if that's going to really fit for you. Make them want you <laughs> as much as you want them. Yeah. And you know? it's also like, how do you, how do you flip something that could be perceived as a liability as an asset? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So let's do this. I think this is a we're at a good point right now to take a quick break. When uh, when we come back, I want to hear kind of some of the the results of some of the the data that uh, you identified in your research and uh, explore some of the the questions that you were asking in creating a a tool for looking at organizations in um, and how organizations can support those with invisible disabilities. So um, we will take a quick break and we will be right back. <laughs> If you're listening to this on the day that it came out, and if you've heard about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, then get ready. Because tomorrow, May 17th, from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific, that's 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern, my team and I are going to be hosting a drop-in style registration event. And you can join us anytime between those times, where we'll be available to answer your questions and help you get registered. How can you join us? The first step is to go to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our intro 
interest list. Once you've added your name, you'll get notified by email when we'll be going live. All you have to do is RSVP so you can join us anytime. If you get registered with us tomorrow, we'll be giving you $500 off the cost of enrollment when you join sections led by either Coach Kristen Martz or Coach Brian Hentler. Whether you're new to ADHD Rewired or you've been listening for a while and even thinking about joining our coaching groups, then now is the time. Remember, for tomorrow's drop-in event, you won't even have to do any of the pre-registration steps ahead of time. All you need to do is add your name at coachingrewired.com and get RSVP'd, and we'll walk you through the rest while you're there live with us. So if you're tired of feeling overwhelmed and you want to create actionable plans tailored towards your ADHD and learn with other adults with ADHD who actually understand the challenges that ADHD can bring, then don't wait. Get started by going to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our interest list so you can join us tomorrow, May 17th, during any time that works for you. It's tomorrow between 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Central. That's coaching rewired.com and we hope to see you there all right we are back with jessica hickstead let's dive into some of this research i think we should probably start with um maybe defining some things just in case maybe this is the first time somebody is listening to this podcast and it's going to be very very new into this world what's an invisible disability so an invisible disability is any aspect that inhibits regular function of a person that could, has no outward appearance. I've actually um, split them into three different categories as neurodivergent invisible disabilities, which are your ADHD, autism, bipolar, depression, even in some aspects, schizophrenia before it gets to the extreme aspect. And I totally just blanked on the name for that. <laughs> Seizures. Wow. ADHD brain. Here we go. <laughs> uh, and, and so many more. I, too many to list here. Then there are your physical invisible disability. So you have your chronic pains, fibromyalgia, mm. uh, irritable bowel syndrome, anything that kind of interacts with the physical body, but you still can't see it unless someone were to tell you. And then uh, your sensory invisible disabilities, which would be like hearing and I, you know, seeing impairments, especially now <laughs> with all this great technology we have. Someone can be deaf in an ear, my own sister is, and have this little itty tiny bitty hearing aid that helps her brain think it can hear from both sides. But she's still obviously impaired. Uh, and the same with um, sight impairments. There are people that can quote unquote see, <laughs> but their vision really isn't that great. But you wouldn't know that. So it, there, there's so many things that umbrella under invisible disabilities. And that's why I wanted to, I didn't want to look at just one aspect because I didn't want to leave people out because this is such a big thing. And so many of these individuals are in the workplace. Yeah. And it's interesting too. I know that the, the sort of the neurodivergent umbrella, um, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it, it's like, like most things, it's not like this, like, um, straightforward that someone, you know, some like, you know, intellectual body created this term and then defined it and everyone agrees on it. It's like everything else that like, nobody really agrees on who, yes. who's in the umbrella. Uh, you know, some people with autism will say, well, that's just, that's just for us. The, then the, the ADHD and autism, you know, autistic community is like, well, that's ours. And then, you know, we'll hear about, about people with bipolar and they're like, well, no, that's us too. And then I've heard, I've heard people, no, it's like not you. It's like, isn't it just people whose brains are wired differently? Yes, that, that's what I say. A nerd of it means neurons in your brain are diverge from the normal aspect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you talk about not just um, not just disclosure in the workplace, but intended disclosure. What do you mean by that? So I wanted to see kind of because there is this big aspect of people who are okay with disclosing and who aren't. So finding what aspects within an organization makes someone more willing to, so their intent more willing to disclose versus their intent not to disclose. That was an important aspect to help relate, to give an organization that quantifiable <laughs> number to say, okay, here's how your organization answered. And here's how these people who, you know, identify as invisible disabled, why they're okay with disclosing or thinking about it versus, oh, heck no. Okay. So, <laughs> All right. So what, what did the data say? One of the big important ones, and this is the one where I want, this is why I say, please disclose. 
is currently in any, <laughs> the two surveys I found, <laughs> I should say, they said anywhere, one said 30% and the other 18% of working employees have an, you know, have an invisible disability. My data found 74%. Wow. That's a <laughs> huge difference. Yes. And that's why I'm saying is like, they're looking at such, you know, just like a small aspect, they're not getting the real numbers. The data I went after was everyone 18 or older <laughs> that are currently working or had worked in the last five years. And why I did the had work in the last five years? Because so many, unfortunately, laid off, fired, you know. So that, that's still a working individual in my book. <laughs> so. And I was, when I, when I was asking you about your, uh, your research before, I was so impressed with your sample size. Yes. <laughs> you had a thousand participants. Over the whole was over 1,400, I think 14, 13. Um, and it, you'd got to do some data cleaning. So the, the participant, usable participant was 837, which is. That's, that's a great each. sample size. Yeah. That's, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's near being published. Is that, is that where you're at right Yes. Now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm uh, like, it's going through all its editing processes and. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what were some of the uh, like, what were some of the questions that your your uh, survey asked? I'll, I'll highlight three of the questions. Um, so my my survey looks at three factors is what they're called. Uh, ableism, acceptance and um, advocacy. And the three that were found needing the most help, like that both populations, those with and without rated the lowest for the workplace in acceptance was my workplace educates managers on invisible disability accommodations. Okay. And like all these things, I'm like, yep, that makes sense. <laughs> because a lot of, lot of the perception is that accommodations cost so much money and oh my gosh, we can't do that. When in fact, they really don't. <laughs> like it's a set of headphones or being okay with someone wearing headphones. And most people, when you're neurovision, if you like things a certain way, you're going to bring your own <laughs> I don't have to explain that for our, our followers here. <laughs> or, you know, lighting changes or just making sure your workplace. I'm sure I can speak for a lot of people here. I hate hearing lights. <laughs> like, Me too. Me nuts. Now, luckily, instead of those noisy fluorescent bulbs, there's LED bulbs that can fit in the same light. So it's not like they have to change light by a different light bulb. <laughs> it's better for the environment anyway. Or things like asking for different kinds of breaks. I mean, there's some workplaces that you have set breaks. So if an individual comes and say, hey, I don't mind shorter breaks more often, or I just want one big long break because I work better in long spurts, that's not going to cost anyone any money. <laughs> it's just being like, okay, yeah, do that. And it, that's that whole, you know, just that education and understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other one on, <laughs> on the ableism factor, the worst rated. So ableism and ableism come from without or within. And I find myself doing it to myself too. It's any kind of aspect of thinking a person can function normally or are making it up even when they have a disability. So it's like, it's even saying, well, you don't look like you're autistic. <laughs> like, that's ableistic. <laughs> I didn't know there was a look. You wouldn't believe how many times I've had people say that even in the education atmosphere. I had a dean tell me that, but you don't seem autistic. <laughs> like, wow. In, oh, in an academic setting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ableism. I think mm -hmm. w w one of the uh, a, a um, an example of where I often see or f feel that sort of ableist attitude is online social media. People yes. who were like correcting people, like like where they miss the whole point of the post and they're just focusing on like a typo or using the wrong form. I'm like, you know, like I'm pretty sure I had dyslexia, and so uh, you know, and it's just like this assumption that oh, everyone has the same abilities. And part of this, too, comes from this, I think, of almost like this, in a strange way, a, a deficit of theory of mind. Because I think people mm -hmm. sometimes think that, oh, well, I can do this, so everyone should be able to do this. Yeah. Or it's all in your head. You know, just just make it go away. Oh, oh okay. It's gone. I don't have it anymore. <laughs> cool. All right. So <laughs> the you, walk in the wall. <laughs> so you're finding a lot of ableism in the workplace. Unfortunately, yes. In, in, in many different aspects. Um, from having to sit in on meetings. I mean, that right there, expected to sit still and be quiet. Like, so I, fi I finally in a workplace was like, look, I cannot sit and pay attention. Like those two don't go together for me. So if I get up or if I sit in the back of the room, I am not disrespecting you. 
that's just how I function. That's what I need to do. <laughs> so how did you ask, how did you ask organizations about this? Uh, I just finally found out whoever was like putting on the meeting and I would just go up to them, get into the meeting early and just, hey, I just want, want to respect that, you know, that I may get up, I may stand in the back. Uh, that's just what I need to do, do. So I am paying attention or even I may be drawing a picture. That's how I, I pay attention. I just let them know that. And they're like, oh, OK, cool. Thanks for letting me know. And then on top of it, I would ask, you know, is there someone taking the many minutes? Can I get those emailed to me? Or asking for the agenda before the meeting, you know, from my manager or whoever just say, hey, is someone sending out the agenda for this? Like, <laughs> And that sounds like a lot of the advocacy piece. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Right. So, all right. Tell us, share some more of the, the questions that. Um, yeah. yeah. So the question on the ableism side that got the worst, this one's reversed. So the better it gets rated, the worse it is. So uh, attitudes in my workplace towards invisible disabilities leave me feeling emotionally exhausted. Which obviously makes sense. Like the more you're having to deal with these negative connotations, it's gonna bring you down. It's gonna exhaust you. If you're sitting there and talking to someone, as much as I'll keep a smile on my face when someone says, Well, you don't look autistic, I'm just like, Thanks for just stripping me of everything I am. <laughs> it's like that's that's called my mask. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I've I've started to do that with people. I'd be like, Thanks, that's called, you know. 40 some odd years of masking. I'm great at it now. <laughs> oh. And then it, you know, which then opens up the conversation, which is great. Masking, what's that? <laughs> you know. And then on the advocacy factor, invisible disability inclusion in the workplace creates a strong organizational foundation of understanding, which was really interesting. You know, so they're saying that it's not there. Like they're not having the dis inclusion, the understanding's not there. So we got work to do. We want to do all these great things. Organizations are saying, yeah, we're accepting. But yeah, how much of that is a mask? <laughs> so you're saying that there's on the organizational level, that there's a lot that they're seeing that people are, the organizations are saying that we're accepting. But yes. they're really, and do you think it's that, they, that they're that they saying they're not? Or do you think it's that, they, or that they're saying that they're accepting, not realizing that they're not? Or do you think that they're saying that they are because they don't want people to know I, how much they're not? I, I think, I think it might be a mix of both, you know, we know there's a lot more out, outwardly, you know, talk about in neurodivergency and inclusion. So of course, everyone wants to be on the background again. And yes, yes, we'll accept this, but not being held really accountable for it. Uh, not knowing how to instill, when the people are in the inside and, you know, they're, they're feeling this, that like, yeah, they want this advocacy, they want this inclusion, but where's my employee resource group? Or what are you doing? What kind of education are we receiving here about it? What kind of things can we do to advocate or to be allies? <laughs> where, where are those programs? <laughs> now, what kinds of things do you think that managers and, and directors um, in organizations, what do they need to understand um, you know, if, if there were a couple, a couple sort of main ideas. To have, to have transparency would be one, is the opening the door to that communication. Even if the, you know, manager is not on, you know, invisible disability scale, it's still opening that conversation. Hey, we're all different here. We're all work different, but we're all included. Saying if anyone wants to wear a headset for working, go ahead. I, I know that's fully acceptable asking their employees, you know, what can be done better in your environment to uh, help you work better and listening to them. And then that's not making anyone disclose, be like, hey, the lighting is like really harsh where I'm working or it's flickering. Can we fix that? <laughs> and that could be for anyone. It's not saying you're disclosing that you have a disability needing that change. It's just uncomfortable for you. And then from there, once that transparency is open, that that's okay. And transparency on the sense that it's important to know your well-being and your boundaries. So even as a boss being like, hey, I'm going to take this day off. I'm 100% not reachable. Showing employees that that's okay to do that by doing it yourself. Yes, you got to be that model. Yeah. I know. I remember, uh, I don't remember how long ago this was, but when Gmail. What kind of degrees they have the or don't have. Where you can delay send. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to like look like you were sending emails at midnight. It's like, yep, I wrote this at midnight and then went to bed and it was sent at seven in the morning. It looks like I'm an early bird, which I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Hey, let's, let's I want to take one more quick break here. When we come back, I want to talk about some of the uh, 
the economic factors for workplaces on why this is actually good business sense to be uh, more accommodating for neurodivergent brains. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons. And I want to welcome Mark R. and Asia S. who joined us recently by going to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. If you love this show and you want to support the work that we are doing, then consider becoming a patron. Support can start at any amount that makes sense to you. Want some perks from the show? Then we've got them. Because at $5 a month or more, you can get every episode with no interruptions. but still get the announcements like this one at the end of the show so you don't miss out on what's going on here at ADHD Rewired. And at $25 a month, you can get our ad-free episodes and you could join me for our patron-only monthly coaching call that we do every fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. If you want to hear the tips and tricks that we share every month and you can get the audio recording of our monthly coaching calls and our ad-free episodes when you become a patron at just $10 a month. Whether it's because of the ad-free episodes Episodes or our monthly coaching calls, or you simply want to support the work that we are doing because you believe in what we are doing. Your support is very much appreciated. Thank you to all of our patrons, old and new. Consider becoming a patron over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thank you. Are you often lost in a world of tasks, finding it hard to stick to your long-term goals? Do you feel like your ADHD might be acting like a roadblock on your path to success? Well, we have something that might be just the answer you've been looking for. Introducing Goal Guide, the revolutionary new product designed specifically for adults with ADHD to manage and track their long-term goals. Imagine having a personal assistant that keeps you on track, gently reminding you of your goals and celebrating your progress with you. That's Goal Guide for you. With its state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, Goal Guide creates a tailor-made path for you to achieve your goals. It sets realistic milestones, sends reminders, which includes reminding you why you felt this goal was important in the first place, and it even suggests helpful resources based on your unique challenges and strengths. Most importantly, Goal Guide understands that the journey is just as important as the destination. So it encourages regular breaks, mindfulness practices, and rewards you for each achievement, no matter how small. Goal Guide isn't just another productivity tool. It's a compassionate partner that works with you, not against your ADHD. It values progress over perfection, reminding you that every step forward is a victory. And if Goal Guide sounds too good to be true, it's because it is. But what's not too good to be true is that many benefits of Goal Guide are actually found right here at ADHD Rewired. From the podcast to our coaching and accountability groups to our adult study hall community. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn more about everything we do here. And if you're listening right now but not subscribed, be sure to subscribe and follow ADHD Rewired in your favorite podcast app. All right, we are back with Jessica Hickstead. All right, let's talk money. All right. What is the uh, value and benefit for businesses to be more inclusive and accommodating for people with invisible disabilities? What did the data show? The data shows that, well, like we talked about on the whole masking scale and you're using your executive function. When you're using an executive function, meaning you aren't able to be productive. Business is all about productivity. So when you increase acceptance, which was the biggest, you know, area that showing statistical significance towards a good workplace that's accepting and people disclosing, you're going to then have more productivity because you're going to promote people to disclose, to be able to produce and take down those masks, which equals money. So it's not, acceptance doesn't take money, like really doesn't. I mean, it's just educating, it's talking, it's looking at people as a whole person, not just uh, the stigma and stereotype of, well, you have a disability. And so because that you can't do things, we know we're very capable. (laughs) There's actually been research that shows people with disabilities because having work gives them purpose. When they're accepted, they actually work and produce more than a normal count, normal (laughs) 
whatever that is, counterpart, <laughs> non-disabled. <laughs> so what about, I'm going to play because sort of devil's advocate here for a second. What about the, the CEO or the, the manager that says like, yeah, you know, we have an accepting workplace, but you know, like this person needs to like accept that we have deadlines and they need to meet them. Like how, how can I sit, how can I sit here as their boss and accept that they're not having deadlines? It's adjusting their work, adjusting their deadlines, just because everyone else produces in a certain aspect, in a certain way, working with them. Maybe they aren't meeting those deadlines because they have a million people coming to their desk and bothering them and it stops their work process and that doesn't work for their brain. So again, it's talking to your employees, letting them put up if that works for them. I do not disturb sign, do not disturb until, <laughs> you know, and giving them that, you know, two, three hour, whatever usually helps them to get their process and then they can take a break. A very easy thing. It doesn't cost money. I mean, what, two cents to print out a piece of paper that says do not disturb. <laughs> so what, <laughs> Write what, it on a piece of notebook. <laughs> and, and, and I think one of the, the points here that I want to really um, put a, a emphasis on is acceptance in the workplace from, you know, from your boss does not mean that you're as an employee, an employee, you're not accountable to like, you're still accountable mm -hmm. to do the work that everybody else is doing. The acceptance mm -hmm. piece is we accept that you may need to do it a different way. Yes, exactly. You, you may, instead of having a million meetings that breaks up your day, the boss, ex, you know, excuses you from those meetings, gives you the minutes and lets you just work. And then you <laughs> you produce better than everyone else because when our brains hyper focus, main, you know, crazy things happen. <laughs> you know, I find it so interesting to you, like how many, uh, we know that there's a lot of, of people with ADHD who are self-employed. Yes. Uh, and for, you know, for reasons like myself, I've like, I'm, I don't know, I'm too strongly opinionated and like things a certain way and which is usually <laughs> my way um, to, uh, you know, but I think that one of the, the things that I find surprising is that when we I've seen successful uh, people with ADHD who are owning their own businesses, that there's still this like self-imposed ableism that I sometimes see. And it's like, honey, y like you could do this differently. You don't need to, <laughs> to be like doing this like a quote unquote normal person. Right. I find that piece really fascinating. When it's it's so much of this ableism has been like indoctrinated into our culture, when that you know it's like oh wait we can do things differently we don't have to do it like you know the the person that owns a similar business down the street does it I can do it my <laughs> own way right? it's like you know, I I I, for, I play pickleball in the morning right like my early morning meetings are eleven a.m. most of my early morning meetings are noon right yeah because I know my brain works uh, so much better when I exercise in the morning yeah right exactly. and I know despite like well recently I've actually been doing much better with my sleep. I tried for a while doing the getting up at 6 a.m. to work out. And like, I think that there is a, um, a, a clause under like the, the Geneva Convention for Torture of like how it <laughs> felt to wake up at 6 a.m. and go to work out right away. Uh, it, just, it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't working for me. Um, if you are self-employed, make it work for yourself. Right. And yeah. that's an easy listen one to, to yourself. If you work better from midnight to 3 a.m., work midnight to 3 a.m. and take a nap during the day. I, I mean, <laughs> it's your job. <laughs> did you in any of your data, did you see any industries that were uh, sort of better with acceptance in the workplace than others? I didn't ask people to uh, say what their job title was. I did um, have it pulled out from just an employee to middle management to upper management those kind of things and individual, what kind of degrees they have or don't have. It was interesting how things trended, <laughs> like where the upper management, and I've seen this in other things, upper management thought they're doing good, but the, like, like the middle management's like, no, we're not good at this. <laughs> like, we're not good at accepting people and not good at advocacy. It's like, and it, which makes sense because the middle management are usually the people right there with the people, like <laughs> knowing what's going on yeah. and your upper management Unfortunately, they're the ones writing the policies. And so that that's showing that, hey, <laughs> we need to fix this disparity here. You need to start listening to your middle management to really help with these policies. So where do so. people start to, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's still sounds like a lot of, of data that is sort of being uncovered and is being better understood. 
are we right now still at this we still need to learn more about it phase or do we do you feel like we have a good amount of data on here like we need to start like getting this the word out on this my hopes now is and i wanted to get into actual an organization like a singular organization and do the survey that posed a little difficult with the dissertation and i think half of it is because it's not published to an article yet you know and it's so new and i think so many people are still scared without admitting they're scared they're like oh my god we're going to be taken to eoe and, and ada is going to come after us <laughs> oh interesting Pol a lot of politics involved in it then. Oh, yes, a lot. So that that is the hopes is now is to get an organization on board and say, hey, let me run the survey within. Let's see, see where strengths and weaknesses are and see what you can enact to change those. Mm. And then, you know, retest in a year and then see where, you know, the perceptions are to see if things are trying. Is that working? Is it not working? What else can we do? And I think it's going to take that. It's, it's going to take people opening their eyes and it's going to take a lot of hard work. All, but all we're progress getting there. always has though, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Look at, look at every other stigmatized group. It takes a lot of work. <laughs> Was there anything from uh, that your, that your data showed that you were kind of surprised by? What was the one that I was like really, the, the one thing I, I found interesting, I did have people ask both if they were diagnosed and whether they identified. So of the 74%, a majority, 83% of that 74%, so a majority of that percent, and I know that all these percents get crazy, both diet were diagnosed and identified. So a pretty good portion. But almost 10%, it was 8.8% actually had diagnosis, but didn't identify. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. So that's like self-ableism right there. It's like you've gone oh. out, you've gotten the diagnosis, but you don't deny yourself that you have a dis disability. <laughs> I wonder for those people how much of that is like they 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 might be like on paper and the results that they're doing okay, but my question would be like, what is that costing them? Like how yeah, and, hard and, is it to do that? And I gotta say, like I probably have been that for myself all along as well, because even when that psychologist said, you know, you are too. I mean, it took me another what was it another ten years or so before I actually went and oh, got really? the diagnosis. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah, I didn't go right away and get it. I was just like, no, I'm fine, I'm good. I've been fine all these years. I'm good. <laughs> wow. All right. Let, let me ask you this. We, we're almost out of time here. For an, an employee, uh, especially if there may be someone who's going to interview for a job, what are some questions that, are, that a prospective employee could ask to try to sort of gauge if this might be a, uh, a, a friendly workplace for uh, neurodivergent brains? So one of the ones is like, what types of yearly training does your organization complete? I mean, and, and you'll get the standard ones. So I, good thing is to listen to that as listening for if they have inclusion training, you know, if they just go over, well, yeah, security training and this and that, and blah, blah. Number one is probably just a blank answer. So you're not getting that person's true aspect. <laughs> so yeah, one thing is like learning how to listen. How does this company support work-life balance? That's a good one right there. And that doesn't disclose yourself because work-life balance is for anyone. Do they do parental leave? Do they promote extra days off? Are they okay when you just call in sick or do you have to like provide them 50 things to say, yes, you were actually sick? <laughs> At workplaces do that. Mm. This is a big one that I came up with. Are employees required to attend social gatherings? Interesting. <laughs> Huh. Because think about that, anyone, ADHD and autism, any neurodivergent, sometimes going to forced so, social care, that anxiety, that, uh, yeah, it's like, no, no, this is my time off. I don't want to be forced into another. You're just thinking about introverts, right? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> introverts, yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and that's not clinical or, or pathological. It's just like what feeds you. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you like your home time. <laughs> So that one, I think, is great to ask, you know, workplace. Another one, what kind of diversity and inclusion teams does the company host? So listening to their answer on that, I'm like, do they have a disability employee research group? Do they not? How perceptive is the company to new ideas, different perspectives, and change? That I mean, that shows diversity and inclusion right there. Because if they're like, no, we're, we're pretty set. And this is how we do things. You're just okay. So you guys don't like change at all. All right. I mean, if you're okay with that, go to the, the workplace. But I think 
especially when it comes to uh, be more diverse and inclusive, you've got to be willing to change. You've got to be open to new ideas and new perspectives. So if a workplace is not, then may not be a place for you to go for. <laughs> or just know it's going to be very short term. <laughs> All right. So Jessica, if, if there could be one big change, one big change for in the workplace to help individuals with invisible disabilities, what would that big change be? Oh, geez. I think the biggest change would be like during the application progress pro process bleh, that organizations would start to ask, how could we make the working environment work for you? Hmm. Literally open up the door. That seems like that would be such a helpful question for all employees, right? Exactly. Like, and for the whole company. Like, yes. Oh, I, I think that's a great question. Yeah. How, how can we make the workplace work for you? Hmm. And like, yeah, like you said, it, that would go toward everyone. That is you a know, win, would, win, win question. I would work better with an hour long break versus two 15 minutes and a 30 minute. Okay. You got it. Like an organization actually be okay with what people say. Hmm. All right. Uh, Jessica Hickstead, thank you so much for the work that you were doing and for sharing uh, this and uh, congratulations. And, and I know you're like, nearing the finish line uh, for publication. So uh, let us know when uh, you actually uh, do get published. And uh, again, thank you so much. This was, this was a pleasure. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. 
Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown, The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator Jim Dale is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers, reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things and we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.